allow me to welcome you to the University of Pennsylvania for our demo show today. Our topic today is going to be the physics of motion. Shameless plug. Next year, we're going to have a physics of electromagnetism. The year after that, a physics of light. The year after that, a physics of energy. So your science teacher can come here all four years of high school and you see a different show. Shameless plug, shameless plug. I like how you changed that too. If we can write an energy show, so you know there will be Yeah, I'm going to write an energy show. <laughs> so... We're going to talk about physics, but before we're going to talk about this physics, first we need to let you know who we are. My name is Peter Harnish. I am the undergraduate uh, laboratory manager, coordinator, whatever. I write all of the physics labs that undergrads do here at, uh, here at Penn. My other two hosts are... Mary Markopol, I run the lecture demonstration lab here, so we're playing with a lot of my toys that I have inherited from the one and only Bill Berner, who is mm -hmm. now retired and isn't here. No, he's here <laughs> because they're playing with physics toys and I couldn't stay home. Uh, and I'm really happy that they're continuing this. Uh, it's just grand that we're doing this. So I'm quite grateful to my successors who have expanded this to three days and are going to expand it to all sorts of other things. So this is wonderful stuff. All right. The other bit of background I would like to give you is the University of Pennsylvania, because that's you know our host today and all of this. So the University of Pennsylvania was founded by Benjamin Franklin, and, uh, uh, older than the country. <laughs> Otis University. There are books on this. You can go read them. <laughs> Like you, what I really know about is my backyard. So I would like to tell you about my backyard, which is the corner of 33rd and Walnut. I am a firm believer that this is one of the most important intersections in the city, and I am now going to preach at you why. So, to get, let you know where you are, you entered here. That's that front entrance. If you cross 33rd, you end up in the Moore School of Electrical Engineering. Back in 1946, the entire first floor of that building was a thing called ENIAC, which was the first universal computer. When we say universal computer, we mean a computer that will run whatever program you ask it to, right? It's not only a pedometer, it's the entirety of your phone, right? It does all the things. To give you an idea of how powerful ENIAC was, the electricity bill for ENIAC was half a car per hour. Right? So that's how much electricity had to go into this machine. ENIAC was so fast, your phone is only a million times faster than it. Mm -hmm. And its memory was big enough that it would have required 140,000 of them to store one MP3. Now, that is not me making fun of this computer. That is me reminding you how young computers actually are and how amazingly far we have come in such a short amount of time to have this utterly unrecognizable computer in your phone as compared to the entire first floor of that building. Now, if we were to cross Walnut instead, we end up at the laboratory for the research on the structure of matter. This was Penn's brilliant idea that if we take physicists and chemists and mathematicians and make them live together, they might actually talk to one another. And then interesting things might happen. And many interesting things have, including the 2000 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to the discovery and development of conductive polymers. What does that mean? To phrase that another way, plastics that act like metals when you put them in circuits. To say that in an even simpler way, the thing that makes a touch screen work was invented across the street. 
Now, if we go to our building, David Rittenhouse Laboratories. If you don't know who David Rittenhouse is, it's a good name to look up. He was the second great American scientist after Benjamin Franklin, was head of the first US Mint, did all kinds of great things. In 2002, the Nobel Prize in Physics, well, half of it, was awarded for the detection of cosmic neutrinos. Yes, Nobel Prizes can be divided in half. Everyone gets a whole medal, they just break up the money. But Ray Davis won this Nobel Prize. What he did was he built a machine out in a silver mine out west. And he said that if this machine works perfectly, it will detect 12 atoms per month. And he turned it on and it detected four atoms per month. And everyone went, Ray, your machine is not so good. And he went, no, I think my machine works and you need to rethink your fundamental understanding of how stars work. That is a heck of a fight to pick. Ray Davis picked that fight in 1967, and that fight ended in 2002 when he won a Nobel Prize for how good his machine was that caused them to rewrite the textbook on how stars work. <laughs> Sometimes you have to put in a lot of work and it can be an uphill battle to get science done. Slightly more recently than that is the Atlas Detector. Now you may have heard of CERN, which is a big particle accelerator in Europe. It is the largest machine ever built. And probably the reason you heard about it was its discovery of the Higgs boson, which was a particle that fundamentally changed our understanding of mass and matter. The device that did that measurement was designed 60 feet that way. On the other side of that wall is where that device was prototyped, designed, and built. Now, we cannot take the credit for discovering the Higgs boson. There are literally thousands of names on the papers that prove the Higgs boson was there. But a lot of work went, was done right here in this very building to get that measurement done and understood. Even more recently, the 2019 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics was awarded for topological insulators a thing so advanced, so cutting edge, no one knows what they're good for. <laughs> but there's a thing called a quantum computer that if we ever get one to work, it would be able to search the entirety of computers in a second. And when I say entirety of computers, I don't mean Google. I mean Google and your phone and your computer and every computer in every office in the world in less than a second. That kind of utterly ridiculous speed. If we ever manage to build one of these, it's probably going to be built using topological insulators. And probably about two weeks later, they will decide to give Charlie and Gene a Nobel Prize for this. Now, there's one corner left at 33rd and Walnut, which is Hill College House which is a first year dormitory. I have showed off my intersection to a lot of people and many of them go, that's great news. We can knock that building down and build a new lab and do even better work. And to that I say, you're missing the point. The entire point of all of this is that we're a school. All of these people with all of these breakthroughs have jobs because they teach. Everyone who works in their labs is here because they are a student who wants to learn. The entire point of all of this, the point of the whole university, is that we are a school and that we, there are people here who want to learn and we happen to get a lot of good science done teaching them. So I think the fact that one of the corners is a first year dormitory is probably the most important part of that intersection. Because none of this is possible if there aren't people coming here to learn and do good work. 
Now, one last thing I want to say about that, and that a thing you might not have noticed in the inter when we introduced ourselves, is none of us said doctor. None of us got our PhDs. Yet somehow we teach at the University of Pennsylvania. How did we sneak in that door? <laughs> Some of you are going to go on in studies in academia. I cannot stress this enough. A doctorate is a good place to end. It is not the pinnacle. It is not the end goal. It is a good goal if that's what you're doing. There's nothing wrong with getting a master's degree. There's nothing wrong with, not getting a, with only getting a bachelor's degree. There's nothing wrong with getting only a technical degree. There's nothing wrong with just getting a job. The way you get ahead is by doing such good work at the thing you do that they can't not hire you. <laughs> That's how we snuck in. That we are good enough at this that we were a better choice than people with PhDs. All right. So that is the last bit of my preaching um, before we get on to the physics. So you came here to learn about the physics of motion, and Mary is going to start us off with that. Yeah, so uh, for those of you that are in high school, you started off with kinematics, right? Yeah. Right? But like, that was the easy part, right? That was like, and you're sick of that. You thought it was hard when the school year started, and then you got like into Newton's laws, and you were like, when can we go back to kinematics, right? Um, and for those of you that are in middle school, you're getting to like just the beginnings of motion probably now in the second half of the school year. So we're going to skip over kinematics completely, and we're going to go ahead and talk about Newton's first law, right? Newton's first law. What is it, according to your textbooks? Right, objects are best to stay at rest. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. The little unsaid part of that, which is that Mary likes to make Pete pick stuff up. Um, but, uh, but that's news first law. There's another piece to it, though. Unless acted upon by, unless acted upon by an outside force. That's important. Oh my gosh, I see Benton too. Mm -hmm. But I'm um, so excited. I have some people here. Yeah. Um, but uh, so we want to talk about that news first of all. We want to talk about each of the laws and break them down into normal language because everybody can regurgitate what the book says. But what in the world does that mean? So you guys get home from school. Maybe you don't want to start your homework yet. And you get home and you say, Mom, Dad, parents are legal guardian. Where's the remote? <laughs> Wherever you left the remote. Right? You, don't, you don't need a PhD to know the, that part of Newton's first law. Objects are resting in state rest. But we want to show it to you on a better scale. You came all the way down here. We can do better than hitting things with a hammer. Mm -hmm. Because totally your teachers could do that at their desk, right? Uh, right. If I stand on this, and I want to point out my dad's in the audience today. <laughs> And Pete rips this out from under me because he's my work brother and he would totally do that. <laughs> What's gonna happen? You're gonna roll off. I got some fall, I got some roll off. Am I gonna go forward? Am I gonna stay still? Let's find out. Three, two, one. So, we've known that first part, objects are stay at rest for literally forever, as long as we've known things. That second part is much newer, right? We, as humans, are we much different than the ancient Romans? No, biologically we are functionally identical to the ancient Romans. But, we figured this out and they didn't. So why were we able to figure it out? We're not s smarter than them. We've been to more school than they have. Right? It's not a question of brilliance or intelligence. It's actually a question of technology. So think of it this way. Think back to all of the art you've seen. right? Frescoes and drawings on vases and the movie Gladiator and the Passion of the Christ and all of these things showing the ancient world. Think about ox carts, think about chariots. 
Did any of them have brakes? No. Would you ride in a truck today that didn't have brakes? No. But in ancient Rome, their trucks didn't need brakes. What's different today than back then? We have roads. They were driving in the mud. When you're pushing a cart in the mud, the moment you stop pushing it, it stops moving. It is only, the reason Galileo and Newton could start to figure these things out was they were the first generations of scientists whose houses had flat, smooth floors. So when they dropped things, they rolled away instead of just landing in the dirt. So, to say something goes on forever is kind of hard to imagine, right? Forever is a big thing. But we can do that in a couple smaller steps to help. So this cart is very Roman in that it has bad wheels. <laughs> so if I give this cart a shove, it stops very quickly, right? Now, Mary's wheels are much more modern. So if I give Mary just a light push, she can coast the whole length of the auditorium because she has this technology on her side. Now, it's not that hard to imagine that if this room was a little bit longer and her wheels were a little bit nicer and the floor was a little bit smoother, she could go even further, maybe twice as far, right? And if it got that much better, she could go a little bit further and a little bit further until we're at a place where all of that is so perfect, she just coasts forever. <laughs> right? That's where we get to with Newton. Right? That he can, that, that gets us to a place where we can see it would go if everything was perfect. Now, we have a, we've said a lot here. Uh, if objects at rest, stay at rest, objects in motion, stay in motion, right? It would be really annoying if we had to say all of that all of the time. So we have developed a nice single word way to say that. Does anyone know what that word is? I hear a lot of people say inertia. I also hear a lot of people go, oh, am I supposed to say something else? <laughs> so for those of you who know inertia, good on you. People who just heard a word, you just heard a word. That doesn't help. So now Bill is going to try to explain that word a bit. So I've been a geek for a long time. <clears throat> I had a head start on it. Um, you guys are working hard at it. You came to Penn today instead of like sitting around falling asleep in class. So good start, okay? But you probably didn't have a rocket scientist for a father <clears throat> and a mathematician for a mother. So I'm in about fifth or sixth grade, and I'm reading some books, and I'm noticing that in those books, they use the word mass, and they use the word weight. And I approach my rocket scientist father, and I say, uh, this seems redundant, Dad. Because I'm a geek, and I know that word in fifth grade. Um, why are there two words? And he says, well, weight is equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity, which didn't help at all. <laughs> it works just fine if you're interested in doing a calculation on something that you already know. But we've got to get to where we already know. <clears throat> so Peter said the first thing. First thing is we need to get a way to reference this thing that applies to all things in all places at all times. So the word inertia is gonna do that. But if we get sloppy and use the word and act as if we know what it means, we've just obscured it even further. And so we really need to know what it means. So why do we need that word? Well, first, let's talk about how you do science. The reason science is different than most other fields of endeavor is that we don't just say things. We say things and then check them. And so after a statement is made in advertising, it's almost never checked on until after you've paid for the product and discover it was a lie. Um, however, 
in science, you make the statement and then you check it. So the way you check things most easily is you talk about numbers. So the second thing we need to do with this inertia thing, if we want to talk about it, is get a number. How do we measure inertia? What are the units on inertia? Because, for instance, you could say, you know, folks in my generation might say, the greatest song ever written was Stairway to Heaven. Is that a scientific statement? No. No. What, how do I quantify greatest? Okay? We can't. But if I want to say inertia matters, I now need to measure it. So nobody knows how we measure inertia? Kilograms, oh my goodness. A voice from nowhere. Okay. Um, and so kilograms measures a quantity that we call mass. Okay? So we need to differentiate because you're you may be very well in the same situation I was. Mass, weight, what's the difference? If we don't change our planet, we can get away with being sloppy. But let's say we're gonna change things. And so Weight is the pull of gravity on an object. And it only happens if there's a planet somewhere near the object. We've got this quantity called mass, kilograms, and now we've got a number. When we say more inertia or less inertia, we now can put a number on it. We can say, all right, here's two kilograms, here's one kilogram. Does that make a measurable difference in the way things happen? We can try. We can check on this statement. But what is inertia? We got a number, we got a name, but do we have a concept? So let's get away from this whole situation where mass and weight are almost interchangeable. Let's imagine that I got the job I planned on when I was in high school, and I'm an astronaut. And I'm an old astronaut who should have retired, and so what they decided to do with me is stuff me into the space station for a couple of years to see how my body deteriorated in the absence of weight on Earth. And so now I'm you know, nearly a year into this event. It's me and this other guy stuck in this tin can. And you can bet that after 360 days, I mean, he's annoying now. After 360 days, he'd be really annoyed, okay? And so at some point, he just goes over the edge, and I grab the instruction manual for the space station, which is a weighty tome, almost as big as an annoying physics book that you have to carry to class, okay? But that's a reason. Now, this is helping you understand inertia, okay? That's the reason physics books are big. So I pick this book up, and I hurl it at him. Well, now, you read the book. He's an astronaut. He knows the book's weightless. So he is now going to take the opportunity to laugh at me and indicate that my attempt is useless. Because by now, you've got a state, you say inertia, and I say, well, what's that? And you say an object in motion will continue to move in a straight line unless acted on by an outside force. Okay? It's weightless. It's moving toward his head. Does he have to worry? Yes. Yeah. It's not inertialist, right? And so the outside force is going to be his temple. And so he can get just as bad a concussion from a weightless book as he can get from a book with weight. And we need to get that sense. We need to realize when do they separate and why do they separate. There are times when we want to talk about weight. There are times when we want to talk about mass. If we can get a conceptual grip, we now know when to bring in numbers and equations. If you say you can't figure out physics, there's a fair chance it's because you've focused on numbers and definitions. Slow down, back up, and say to yourself, how would I describe this to my kid sister? Can I come up with an explanation that makes sense, not with some numbers that I dial up and fill in the blanks with? If you get there, the numbers in the equations suddenly are easy to use. All right, so Bill set us up very nicely there. So now, pop quiz, ha! You thought you were on 
on full track mode, time for good. So, allow me to explain the problem to you. This is a three kilogram mass. For those of you who did not grow up with the metric system, we can also say that that three kilogram mass has a weight of about seven pounds. This string is designed to be able to hold up a weight of about 10 pounds. So I have my seven pound weight hanging on a string that can hold 10 pounds. Now, I have more of the same line and I'm going to hang it on the bottom here. So this is that same 10 pound line. So if I pull this string with 10 pounds, it breaks. The question is, if I pull the bottom string, which string is going to break? Who are the guests? Why? Okay, so this is already pulling with seven pounds, right? So if I pull with four pounds here, four plus seven is 11. That's greater than 10, the top one snaps. Are there any other guesses? All hypotheses are good until we do the experiment and prove that all but one of them were bad. So are there any other guesses? Everyone is going to follow in line behind your new glorious leader. No one has any other ideas. <laughs> really? You're all falling in line. Okay. That's fine. We can do the test. Let's watch that top string. So. What did we say inertia is a measurement of? Right? Inertia is how much something doesn't want to change. So this weight has a lot of inertia. So when I pull on it, it doesn't want to move. So I pull down on the string, and this inertia doesn't want to move. If this point doesn't move relative to this point, there is no change on the top string. And the top string is protected by that inertia. And the bottom string takes all of that force. So as long as we have this inertia in place, we don't need to worry. Oh, no. <laughs> the top string broke. Why did the top string just break? Besides, I am obviously a trickster. Aha! Good. I pulled a little bit differently. <coughs> that second time, I pulled slowly. Now, there's a question that I can see some of you have been pondering since the very moment you came in here. How do I get that armrest? <laughs> so, how do you take someone's armrest? You can't talk to them about it. You can't pick a fight, right? No one wants to be that person fighting. So what do you do? You just lean against the armrest, <laughs> and you lean against it, and you lean against it, and you play the long game, and it's your armrest now. <laughs> if, you, if you push on that inertia with enough time, that inertia is going to move. And once that inertia starts moving, we end up with that scenario that we described. Four plus seven is 11, and the top one breaks. So if we do it slowly, we end up with that answer. If we do it quickly, we end up with the other. Now, unfortunately, it is hard to see when things are very fast. So we can slow things down by changing the experiment a little bit. And we'll use a bungee cord on the top now. So. If I pull slowly on this bottom string, we can get the bungee cord to move, right? I'm going slowly enough that the inertia can keep up with me, 
and the whole thing moves. But if I get this mass to be still and I'm fast enough watching that bungee cord, I can pull the bungee, I can pull the string so fast the inertia doesn't have time to react and the bungee cord didn't change. So this has been an elaboration on that first part of Newton's law. Things that must stay at rest. This next bit is an elaboration on that second part. Things in motion staying in motion. So I, I hesitate to ask, what was the most important discovery in science? Because when I asked, how do you measure inertia, nobody answered. <laughs> you're not working hard enough. Okay, step out there and make a mistake, okay? Because that's the way you arrive at good answers. So, we won't wait for an answer on this. I'm gonna tell you because it's a kind of unlikely thing. It's the printing press. The printing press is what lets science happen. We have just heard that Galileo and Newton spent nearly their whole life figuring out inertia. Without a printing press, you'd be doing the same thing. With a printing press, it took you about 15 minutes of a class three weeks into your course to learn something that took somebody else a lifetime. And so now you know about inertia. It's not a discovery anymore. It's a tool. And this is how we do science. We take what somebody spent a lifetime doing, learn it quickly, and use it in our lifetime to move the ball forward. So, with that thought in mind, let's take a look at a much more basic question, a question that has existed almost as long as mankind, and that is, what is going on out there? The sun goes down, we got stars in the sky, and they move. They don't just sit there, they move. They move predictably. We can set up astronomy, after we set up astrology, we can do all sorts of things. Even in the ancient world, people had sat on a wagon, moved past the forest, and said, look, those trees are moving. Well, no, they knew they weren't. They knew they looked like they were moving because from the platform you were on, everything around you was going the other way. And so that make, makes them realize that when we see things move from our position on Earth, it may be that the thing is moving, but it may also be that the thing is sitting there and we're moving. And the resolution to that could not be done scientifically for most of human civilization. Why? Because we couldn't make an observational test of anybody's statement. So it was a philosophical question, a question that was debated with logical thoughts, but untestable thoughts. All right, so now we've got inertia. And what does inertia give us? Well, it gives us a way of testing whether something's changing. And so I can take this pendulum, which is a massive object that moves in a straight line unless acted on by an outside force. And so our straight line is well defined. You notice it in either of these pictures. They're slightly different. Actually, they're really different. This picture is a camera on the ceiling of the room. And in the universe that we have created here, that's a viewer on a stall, way out there in space. One of those things that moves through the sky at night. This is an observer in a wireless camera connected to the planet Earth. So this is how it would look to an Earth-based observer. I know, you have trouble abstracting. Let's make it concrete. We've got a North Pole visitor, <coughs> resident, who's got the month of January off. Okay? And so here is our Earth-based observer watching our inertial object move. 
If nothing moves, both views are the same, but we know that's not true. We know the sky is rotating. So what happens if, in fact, if the sky does the turning, we would see this whole system sit there while that turns? But if the Earth moves, and we can do this, so let's make the Earth move. Oh. <laughs> now, what does our observer report? Our observer reports that the pendulum came around, and notice what does that look like? It looks as if the map is sitting still and the pendulum is moving. But we've got the first law of motion that says an object continues in a straight line unless acted on by an outside force. So we invent all sorts of weird forces or we say the Earth is doing the moving. So this experiment was first done by the French physicist Foucault in the early 1800s. He found out that the Earth doesn't turn this fast. It's pretty slow. He needed to get a pendulum that swung for a long time. And when he did it, it worked. You have the opportunity of doing that by simply spending a couple of bucks, well, they actually charge more than that these days, right? To go to the Franklin Institute. When you get to the Franklin Institute, you go to the stairwell first. You look down the stairwell, and they've got a great big pendulum swinging back and forth. You're going to take a look at which chess pieces got moved before you got there. You then spend your three or four hours at the Franklin Institute, and before you leave, you check again. There are more chess pieces down. In other words, the Franklin Institute, the city of Philadelphia, North America, and the whole damn planet changed position while you were there. So the motion now is the planet Earth, and the heavens sit still. This is huge. We have gone from a philosophical discussion that lasted for thousands of years to a reliable statement based on fact. And this is why science has taken such a grip on the way we, we understand the world around us. So, that's Newton's first law, which basically comes down to nothing is going to change unless you force it to change, right? I'm gonna let my liberal hang out a little and say maybe that's a little political call to action right now. But, nothing is going to change unless you force it to change. In physics, what is that change that we're talking about? What's that quantity? Well, no, unless you force it to change. We need a force to make the change. What is the change? <coughs> Motion. So what, what does that mean? We want to change. Oh, go for it. Well, if, you're, if something sits still, unless you push it to move it, it's Right, but what is it? So if I change direction, have I accelerated? Yes. Yeah, if I speed up or slow down, have I accelerated? Yes. Yeah. So when we force something to change, we're forcing it to accelerate. And that's Newton's second law. The first law is nothing will change unless you force it to change. And the second law is when you force it to change, it changes. Uh, but what's the wordy version in your textbook? It's a terrible version. Where is it? Yeah, I got the product. F equals MA. F equals MA. Don't you love it when science books tell you math? And they're like, this is math. Go ahead and understand the universe. Yay! It's perfect, right? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the wordy version in your textbook is officially that equation in words. Acceleration is directly proportional to the net force acting on an object and inversely proportional to its mass. What? Right? We should break that down a little bit, right? Um, you read it in your textbook, it means nothing. Your teachers restructure it to say F equals MA still kind of means nothing. So let's talk about the first part. Except, no offense, teachers, I'm super sorry. Um, but so, acceleration is directly proportional to net force. Direct proportion, what does that mean? As one gets big, what does the other do? Also gets big, right? So if I take this chair and I push it, I've accelerated it, right? What if I force it more? It's accelerated more, yes? Right, that's Newton's first law. If you put, or it's not first law, second law, sorry. Um, if you push something really hard, it'll get really fast. Didn't you know that already? <laughs> Thank you, Newton. 
Captain Obvious. It's great. Um, the second part of that, acceleration is inversely proportional to mass. What's an inverse proportion? As one gets big, what does the other get smaller? It gets smaller, right? So if mass goes up, what should acceleration do? It should go down. How can I change the mass of this chair? Put something heavy. Oh, they just totally took a ditty. I can put my work brother in it, right? He's reasonably massive compared to the chair, right? So I increase the inertia of this, and I'm going to give it a push. And now I'm going to push it again, a little harder. And so the first part of Newton's law, of Newton's second law, is true. If I push harder, I accelerate it more. But I couldn't get Pete going as fast as I could get just the chair alone. Right? Right? So if you push something really hard, it'll get really fast. But if it's really heavy, maybe not so fast. Right? Thank you, Newton. This is why we hire piano movers. Right? And because my liberal continues to hang out uh, in a political call to action sense, if you want it to change quickly, you have to force it really hard. Right? And if you've got a lot of stuff in your way, it's going to be harder to change. Right? Okay, so we're not going to go ad nauseum into Newton's third law. That's a demo that your teachers can take home with them. But because we know your teachers are going to do it so much, we wanted to just talk about the terminology a little bit and then move into the third law because as good a job as your teachers do with it, none of you understand it. I know, I did this for like 20 years. And teachers, when I say that, that's with the, I taught for 20 years. So, like, I feel you. I know your pain. <laughs> All right, so the first and the second laws tell us what happens to an object when we get it to move. And so here I've got an object. I give it a push. It moves. We understand that if I don't give it a push, nothing changes. That if I give it a push, its velocity changes. If I push harder or I change its inertia, we get different behaviors, okay? What we haven't discussed is what happens to me. How, how do we get this to move? You know, let's widen our horizon, stop just looking at this. And how, how does this process take place? Well, I'm a complicated mess. Okay, I'm big, I'm biological. Okay, those of us who took physics took it because biology was like smelly and dirty dishes. And so we don't even want to do that. So let's replace me with a nice clean spring. So this thing has a spring in it that can make it move. And we can put it here. And it works just as well as I do. Okay? And you don't have to feed it, and you don't have to do anything else. Okay? <clears throat> so, this lets us see something move. So we can use this whenever we want this thing to move, okay? Just as I could give it a push. And it doesn't move. So it moved down here. No, it doesn't move down there. Anymore. Okay? What about over here? What's my problem? This is not good science. It's not repeatable. Yes, sir? So like, when, it, when, the, when the spring hits the, the little thing, like the wall thing, the wall pushes yeah. back in the opposite direction because of the new and third law. Okay. So it seems that we can't just get something to move. So you're saying that I need to push on something. And then you started talking about this opposite thing. It pushes back, okay. So it does, doesn't seem to be much opposite motion here. It was just motion. Why wasn't there any, op I mean, if, if I need an opposite thing? I believe that because the wall is stationary, it's pretty much pushing all the force into the object. The glue thingy is causing it to move differently. Okay. This is a true statement. Why? So it's connected to other parts, and it has a lot of mass, so the acceleration will be here as well as the car is before. Okay. The track is much more massive than the car. So it turns out that the pushes are equal. 
And that's critical. The third law says the pushes are equal. People who don't understand it in part think the results should be equal, but the results are only equal if the masses, the inertias, are equal. Turns out this isn't just a track. It's a track on a cart on the floor with enough friction that none of those guys are going to move. So the only way anything moves this way is if the whole planet moves that way. That is 6 trillion trillion kilograms. That's a boatload of inertia. So it's not going very far. So let's check it out and see what happens if we push off an identical cart. These carts are about a half a kilogram of inertia. Ooh, nice symmetry. Almost feels like that third law thing you keep quoting, that there are equal and opposite reactions. Okay, so if you state for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, right, that's the thing that people seem to quote, it sounds sequential. It sounds like revenge, <laughs> right? Oh, okay, you move, so this guy. So that, that's not really a clear statement of behaviors. In fact, it is not serial. It's parallel, right, for you computer geeks. Okay, so these two things happen at once. I cannot have one force, period. One force doesn't exist. Forces only occur in matched pairs. And so here, these two forces happen at the same moment. It's not like the blue guy moves and then the red guy moves. They both move at the same time. Okay? So if we... <coughs> so now if we, we go back, we can do this. And now we're in pretty good shape to suggest that the opposite force here was delivered to the much more massive object. So if I want to say that I've only got one force, if I don't see the other force, I probably haven't widened my field of view sufficiently. So when I walk on the floor, you say, well, that's one force, because you're the only thing moving. But we've kind of given you the clue. And the clue is we push off of something. So I'm pushing the earth backwards because my shoes rip the floor. Mary has been floating around here on roller skates for some not always obvious reasons, but it is a critical point. She is not connected to the floor. So she is in a situation where it's much harder for her to get an opposite force. So the two of us are going to race. As Peter gives me a signal, we're both going to move forward by moving our feet in a standard walking gait. Three, two, one, go! So now it's clear that if she can't generate a second force, she can't get a first force. Okay? And I beat her nearly as effectively as Usain Bolt would. Okay? So check for roller skates on Usain Bolt's competitors. Okay? Um, so this is one case where we see it happen. If we throw a ball back and forth to decoupled Mary you say well okay now it's clear why Peter's not moving because Peter is connected to the earth and the whole planet isn't but Mary's not why is nothing happening nothing's happening because it's a damn beach ball it's got <laughs> it's got no inertia whatsoever aha uh -huh. a medicine ball okay <laughs> Now, please note, she gets moved backwards, obviously, by catching the ball, but she also moves when she throws it. And so we've got another wonderful example of inertia, as well as opposite forces. If you have joined the herd of folks who decided that January was when you had had to sign up for the gym. Why do you sign up for a gym? Well, they have lots of equipment that give you opposite forces. You say, well, couldn't I just stay at home? You know, that's what I'm doing in the gym, right? Except what's happening? No force. I can't exert one force. I need to have two. I can only generate forces in pairs. And so now, Peter and I are pulling on this. Okay, we have not practiced. We're not even looking. What do you notice about the dials? 
A, they're both moving, but B, they're reading the same number. So these are matched pairs. These forces come together. I cannot generate a single force. If we would like to make this show, we spared no expense. That's why you come to an Ivy League school. So we have some high-tech devices <laughs> to illustrate. So in this instance, these cars are going to move like generating grip against this surface, okay? They're the same frequency, so I can make both cars move with the same controller. Please note the one car is pushing off the cart, the floor, the building, the planet Earth. The other car is pushing off a four ounce piece of quarter inch plywood. The plywood has less inertia than the car. Two things are gonna happen. The force between the wheel and the plywood is gonna make the plywood move more than the car. The outcome of that is gonna be that this car loses the race, okay? So let's take a look. We ready? And so the opposite force is now very apparent. I should point out, when you're trying to unravel this stuff, one of the problems for both students and teachers is that it's easy to see accelerations, it's hard to see forces. So you want to try to find places where the force reveals itself in some way. When that happens, it starts to make sense. So we've talked about walking, we've talked about driving, which leads us obviously to the next media to go through, which is water. So, swimming is walking in the water. That's it. So we're going to talk about sailboats. So we have here a sailboat. <laughs> now, you may have noticed we are inside, so there's not much water, and there's not much wind. So, for, so we have something to make wind. We have a big fan here. Yeah, it's not beans. Yeah. So we're going to plug this in. We're going to get this fan going. It's going to take a second because it's big. And we're going to hopefully see the sailboat start to move. of Newton 3. In this case, we have wind pushing the sail, the sail is pushing the boat, the whole thing goes. This was making the wind. Why didn't the fan move? It's connected to the floor. Someone paid an engineer a lot of money to make sure that fans don't knock over every time you turn them on. So fans tend to be very good at anchoring themselves. Now, if you spent a lot of time in your childhood reading science books and hanging out next to the water like I have, you may have pondered. We have sailboats that have to wait for good weather, but we've invented the fan. Why don't we just put a fan on a sailboat and call it a day? Now. Is this going to work? Do we have a physics reason it's not going to work? Or are we just assuming that if I'm the person who thought of this first, I wouldn't be working here? <laughs> yes? All right, what is it connected to instead? All right, the fan is now bracing against the sailboat. All right, so let's take a look at this. Right, we have to do the experiment. Nothing. Now, to show you that this is what's going on, Bill, can you pick up the other side of the fan? into the sail. And to make sure it doesn't fall over, it is pushing this way just as hard on the boat. 
So if you push just as hard in both directions and nothing crumbles, you're not going to go anywhere, right? I'm not going. The only way I could go this way is if I go through the table. If I push it just as hard in both directions. So we've talked about walking. We've talked about driving. We've talked about boats. Planes are boats in the air. We're not going to worry about it. The last thing to talk about then is how do you get through space? Yes, come on. All right, so uh, if we turned the fan around, it would have then been an outboard motor. That would just propelled it as a normal boat. So the other way, place we need to get around is space. How do we get around in space? All right, I hear some murmurs of it. I hear some mentions of it. How do we get around in space? Rockets. Like rockets are able to get around in space. Now, we have already shown you a rocket today. You might not have noticed it, but we already did a rocket demonstration. Mary threw a medicine ball at me and went backwards. That's what a rocket is. A rocket is you throw matter behind you to push yourself forward. Now, you can easily imagine a situation where Mary has a backpack on filled with medicine balls. She throws one and she glides for a bit, then she throws another and glides for a bit, and throws another and glides for a bit. And she goes forever and ever, and we call that a rocket. So, this is a very similar situation. What we have on this is a compressed CO2 fire extinguisher. So to use this correctly, we would shoot out a bunch of carbon dioxide, it would cool down a fire very quickly, the primary of oxygen, and it would go out. If instead we removed a bunch of safety functions from it and strapped it to a, a sled, it would instead look like this. but more complicated things we want to talk about. But you've been sitting for a while, and those are a little hard to set up. So you are going to be, we are going to start talking about that at 10 after, whether or not you are in these seats. As a reminder, the men's room is this way in the stairwell. The women's room is this way in the other stairwell. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. All right. All right. So, so far we have talked about Newton one. Objects in rest, stay in rest. Objects in motion, stay in motion. Unless you shove them. Newton two. The harder you shove, the more they'll change. Unless they're big, and then they won't change quite as much. Newton three. Forces always come in matched pairs. All great stuff. But you may have noticed that everything we have done so far has only moved in one direction. It could go forward or it could go backwards, but everything was only in one dimension. We're, we would like to start this second half by going into a second dimension. So the classic way that most people talk about 
two-dimensional motion is with projectiles. And that ends up looking like this. Now, while we all agree that Bill has still got it, <laughs> we can also tell we pretty much knew where that was going to go, right? We knew where it was going to end. So this is pretty well understood. But the whole thing can get a little bit confusing as we mix up these directions with each other. So to make sure that we can keep it straight of how these two dimensions are dependent or not, Mary is going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you because I'm going to talk to you about math. And so I have a degree in physics and I have a degree in math. And everybody signed up for physics so that they could do word problems, right? <laughs> so, um, so in math class, they say to you, y depends upon x, right? We have these two axes, x and y, and they are completely dependent on each other as x changes, y changes, and they rattle off stuff to you like y equals mx plus b and y equals e to the x and y equals x squared and all that stuff, right? Right? And in physics, we would argue that they're incredibly independent of each other, right? They, they don't depend on each other at all, in fact. They both depend upon time, right? They're very dependent upon time. They have time in common. But motion in the x direction and motion in the y direction are just totally independent of each other. So to prove it, we have a little demo that teachers can totally go home with, which is I'm just going to drop this ball. Oh, it's only moving in one dimension. Mary missed the point, right? Uh, it's only moving in one dimension, and you can tell that it's moving along the line of my body, right? What's the force that's bringing it down to the ground? Gravity. Gravity. And if I walk this way with it, now it's moving in the x direction. Why isn't it moving in the y direction? Because I'm holding it. Why isn't it staying in one spot? Because I'm moving it. So I can move this ball with me, and I can drop this ball and have gravity take it, and those motions are clearly independent of each other, right? So why don't we do them together and see if they still behave the same way. So watch the ball as it drops. You can see it move along the line of my body. We're not worried about the bounce. You can see it move along the line of my body, but you can also see it stay with me, can't you? Yeah. Right? I am giving it horizontal speed. What well, velocity, right? Because I just mentioned the direction. But uh, I'm giving it horizontal velocity independently of what gravity is doing to it, right? These motions are totally independent. But as noted, I like to be on skates, which means you probably can't trust me. So what if I'm giving the ball a little push to keep it with me, right? What if I'm doing something that makes it move with me? What if I had something that I could take out human intervention as much as possible and see if these motions are really independent? And so for that, we have this ball launcher. Um, and what this has on it is a metal dowel. And then I have two balls here. Uh, one is going to go on the back of this dowel. One is going to sit in the front. And are we missing a metal plate? There we go. Um, and when I release this launcher, a spring is going to move the dowel and push this ball off, launching it horizontally and it's going to move from underneath inside of this ball and drop it vertically. Which ball, listen to the question, because I know you all think you know what I'm going to ask because your teachers have asked it before, but listen to the question. Which ball will be faster? See, somebody already answered the next question. Which ball will have more speed? Which ball will be faster? It wasn't the question you were expecting, right? Go for it. Right, the one being launched horizontally will be faster. It was given speed, right, as it, as, as it goes. So it's going to be faster. This one's just going to be dropped. Now, here's the next question that you guys were all expecting first. Which one will hit the ground first? Go for it. I'm here in the back one, right? It's just going to drop down one path. Go for it. They both will at the same time. Why? We just said this one's faster. Uh, that's faster in this direction, not this direction. So they're independent. All right. Do we have any other, anybody think the faster one's going to hit first? Because it's like faster. Go for it. You're with that one? All right. So, th so this one's faster, so maybe it'll hit first because it's, it's, you know, it's faster. Right? Let's find out. We have metal plates on the floor so that you can hear it because not everybody can see it and there just are only so many cameras we can put in this room. 
So you ready? Three, two, one. Hear him hit at the same time, right? What's happening there? It's exactly what the young man in the cast said. The, I'm sorry, that's like your... <laughs> and a red shirt. There's a red shirt also. Um, I also signed the agenda without asking. I apologize. But, um, but, right, but so, um, so what's happening here, vertically, these are identical. Yes, the ball that's launched is faster. But look, it went farther also, right? Vertically, according to gravity, both of these were dropped. Neither one of them had any vertical speed to start. They had the same height to go, so they hit the ground at the same time under the influence of the exact same changing force, right? Gravity. Horizontally, yes, this one was faster, and so ultimately it went further. But that's independent of their vertical motion. These are totally independent. And I have to tell you, when you guys make them dependent on each other, you take years off of your physics teacher's life as they sit there grading your papers going, why, why, no, we covered this, right? So like, keep them separate. They're Capulets and Montagues. When you mix them, people die. So, so we understand that that was a little bit hard to see. It was low, it was small. So we took the liberty of taking a much larger, easier to see projectile, shooting it sideways, filming that in slow motion, and then making a time lapse of that motion. And we have that here. So this is not a bunch of pink balls. This is one pink projectile that we have photographed every tenth of a second after we have fired it horizontally. So allow me to walk you through the anatomy of what you see here. Newton tells us that if there was no gravity, no outside force, the ball would continue in the same direction forever. So this rail is the direction the ball would travel if there was no gravity. Each ball is a tenth of a second later. Let's look at the strings compared to their neighbors, side to side. Each string is as close to the string before it as after it. So that distance is constant. If the distance doesn't change and the time doesn't change, what does that tell us about the speed in that x direction? It's constant. So we have a constant speed in the x direction. Now, let's look at the length of the strings. Each string is slightly closer to the one before it than the one after it in height. So each ball is a little bit closer to this one than this one. So those distances are getting bigger. If the distances are getting bigger in the same amount of time, what does that tell us about the speed in the vertical direction? Right, it's increasing. We're accelerating downwards, right? So you have this acceleration due to gravity. Now, the last thing I'd like to point out is the length of each individual string. So let's pick about the tenth one out. So this is the length that you would fall from this position given one second of time. So if the ball started here and dropped for one second, it would end up here. So that is walking through what you see here. But most of the time, we don't fire projectiles sideways, right? Cats knock things off cables. There's the end of Thelma and Louise. But most of the time, projectile motion is not sideways. That joke is only for teachers. Thank you. <laughs> so most of the time, we fire up projectiles up. So let's see what happens if we fire this projectile up. None of the anatomy has changed. If there was no gravity, the ball would still travel along the direction of the rail. Each ball is still a tenth of a second different. 
the strings are still the same distance on either side. So the x velocity is still constant. It's now slower than it was originally. The balls are closer, but it's still a constant velocity. The length of the string is still how far the ball would fall from a given point given that length of time. So how far the ball has fallen from the gravity-free path is still the same. But now that has moved our maximum height a little bit further out. So the point where gravity still starts to beat the ball going up has been moved out and we now have a peak in the middle instead of at one end. But it's still exactly the same motion. To show you that this is not just a nice example, we see that the projectile follows that path. So, pop quiz number two. <laughs> so, there are some physics problems that are so well known, so handy, so repeatable that we give them names. This is one of those. We call this the monkey hunter problem. So, I am a hunter. I am out hunting monkeys because hunters gotta hunt, I guess. And so why not hunt a monkey? Now, I, as a well-educated hunter, understand my prey. And I know that monkeys are scared of guns. So, the moment that I shoot my guns, it's gonna be a bright flash, there's going to be a loud bang, and it's going to startle the monkey. And the monkey's gonna go, ah! And it's going to let go. So the moment that my gun fires, the monkey is going to let go of the tree and start falling. The question is, where do I need to aim my gun to hit the monkey? So, to walk you through this equipment here, there is a switch at the end of the muzzle here that when that is closed, it activates an electromagnet here. So, when something flips that switch like a bullet, oh, uh, that just flipped that up, the monkey lets go and falls. So I know that will be at exactly the same moment. Now, I don't really want to hunt a monkey because they're like little people with fingers and things. And it's just weird. So I'm going to hunt a dinosaur instead. Uh, because if you find yourself out in the woods and you come across a dinosaur, you're hallucinating because there aren't dinosaurs. So it's OK that we're going to be doing this. So the question is, where do I need to aim my gun to hit the dinosaur. Down. Guesses. Down. I hear down. Why down? Okay. So we have someone here who's played a bit of sports ball, right? You throw the ball at where they're going to be, right? If you throw it at the receiver, they're not there by the time the ball gets there. So you have to lead your shot. So that's one guess. Do we have any other guesses? Why at the monkey? What do you mean, because gravity? <laughs> All right, to rephrase that, I just told you how this works. <laughs> if there was no gravity, I would, the, the bullet would follow that rail. When the monkey lets go, it hangs there, and it gets shot. <laughs> if there is gravity, the monkey, given that time is going to fall this distance from the stationary and falling. And that is going to be the same amount that my bullet falls away from that starting trajectory. So, some of you may have noticed that there is a small white dot on the top of that electromagnet. That dot is the same distance above the belly as this sighting scope is above the barrel of the gun. So, when all of this is lined up, now, I 
don't deserve, I don't deserve applause for that because it's physics. It has to be true as long as this lines up. But how did I know how fast that bullet needed to go? How did I know what the muzzle velocity needed to be to make this work? Yes. No, no, they set it up. <laughs> At any point in this, did I give you a number? Mm. No. A second. If I, if the bullet goes faster, it's going to get here sooner. But the dinosaur will have fallen less. If it goes slower, it's going to take longer. But the dinosaur will have fallen more. As long as the bullet reaches the other end, did we reload? As long as the bullet reaches the other end before the dinosaur hits the ground, this is going to work. So, as long as I give it enough air to get there, that hit, I, that, yeah, that hit an inch above the ground. That's the one you actually should applaud for. Is that <laughs> Yeah. So, as we, now, this is great. But what if I'm not hunting monkeys? What if I'm hunting space monkeys? Let's take this exact same physics problem, but now I'm on a habitat on the moon. Now I'm on Europa. Now I'm on Titan. Right? We're on a different planet. Gravity is different. What do I have to do differently? Now that we are on an alien planet. Okay. At any point did I tell you what the gravity in this room was? No. No. It's not 9.81. We're on top of bedrock. That number changes. But we know that the gravity here is the same as the gravity here, which is the same as the gravity here. So whatever gravity my bullet feels, the monkey feels. And if we did all of this again on the moon, it would still all be true. This is actually a pretty simple problem to do. But what if, what if we make this a slightly more complicated problem? What if the monkey isn't scared of guns and the monkey stays in the tree? Even worse. What if the monkey knows what the deal is, and as soon as he sees me, he drops from the tree to try to hide? So I have to get my gun out while the monkey is already falling. That doesn't seem like much more complicated of a question. But at one point, it was so vital that we knew exactly what the answer to that question is, that we invented the computer and built the whole first floor of that building. ENIAC was built to solve that physics problem so we knew where to aim mortars in the European theater in World War II, right? It's only that much more complicated until it gets to a point where we have to invent technology to give us an answer. But we know how to invent that technology because we understand this fundamental enough that the technology can then catch up and we can keep playing that game of hopscotch. Now, there's another way to simplify all of this, but to simplify it, we have to introduce some, a new concept. And to talk about that, we're going to bring out these things. So, um, at this point, if you're in a high school class and you haven't heard the law of conservation of energy, you're going to hear it soon. Um, and believe it or not, the law of conservation of energy looks upsetting at first. And you're like, oh my god, there's so much stuff in there. And what am I going to do with that? But oh my god, it makes your life so much easier. And I can think of like three problems in the first four chapters of a Giancoli text that you should go back and do with energy. And you'll be so much happier. And you'll wonder why your teacher made you do two, do two pages of work when you could have just done the law of conservation of energy. But we need to talk about what energy is. And so my daughter's third grade teacher told her that energy is the force that allows objects to move. 
and it makes me want to vomit every time I say it. Uh, I called Bill the night that my daughter shared this definition with me uh, because I was having a crisis. And like, I think we talked for a half an hour to an hour about what should I do about this because all the third graders in this district think this now. And, um, and so uh, I got a grip. We talked, I mean, Ms. McLaughlin and I talked about it. Um, but uh, but so anyway, um, we'll see what happens when your brother's in third grade next year. But so there's no great definition out there for energy online. Like you Google it, you can Google it, and you get all kinds of weird stuff, and your physics teacher will come in. And I don't have a great definition either. What I can tell you is that energy is a way of describing things. You can look at a little kid, and you can know if they just sucked down 12 pixie sticks or if they have a fever, just by looking at them, right? I can describe the way my son was on Tuesday with 101 temperature. He was a lump on the floor. I can also describe to you what he's like when he gets to eat, it's silly, it's not sugary, but when he gets to eat unlimited amounts of cheese, he's thrilled, right? And he's t full of energy for cheese. Uh, but so, um, we know this, we can tell the energy in an object. And so when we looked at that projectile, uh, we could see the spacing in those, in the stop motion ping pong balls. We could see the spacing getting larger. Did that mean that that ping pong ball had more energy or less energy? More. More, right? It was getting faster. Okay, so there's two different categories of energy that we have to talk about. We have to talk about non-mechanical energy and mechanical energy. Non-mechanical energy, because you know we're in physics, everything has to do with motion. But non-mechanical energy is on a molecular level. You don't necessarily see the object move, but stuff is happening with the molecules, right? That's your food, your temperature, you know, thermal energy, that stuff. Mechanical energy has to do with motion on the macroscopic level, typically. And then we generally put it into two categories. Kinetic energy, which is moving energy. If I give this speed, it's got kinetic energy, a lot of speed. You guys already said more kinetic energy, not a lot of speed, not a lot of kinetic energy. Um, potential energy is stored energy due to position. So we put something, you know, here, and we go there. It has potential energy in it, but it's not moving. So why is it mechanical, right? But what if I put it here? He's, he's nervous now, right? This young person is nervous about the potential that this has to move, right? And there's a reason why I wasn't catching the ball, and it's because I couldn't. And now I'm holding this up over this person's head and it's good stuff, right? So potential energy has to do with positioning and height and elevation, and it's our ability to move, our potential to move. And it's stored there, waiting to be released. If I kick this across the floor, I used my chemical energy because I ate breakfast today. Right, and you saw me eating fudge earlier. Right, I use my chemical energy to give that kinetic energy. Yes, does it have any more kinetic energy? No. What happened to it? Global <laughs> warming. <laughs> was it lost? No, it was not lost. What happened to it? Yeah. it well, not in the potential energy. It's not any higher now, but it was transformed into. Thermal energy, not into friction, because that's a force, right? Friction transferred the energy. Okay, so this is at the heart of the law of conservation of energy. They say to you, energy can be neither created nor destroyed, but we very often forget that important piece, which is, but it can be transformed into other things. So the maximum amount of potential energy you put into a system is the maximum, I can never do this, and I think it's dented now. I do the other one. You do the other one, that's why I can't do this one. Well, now I can't tighten it, so now we've got a real danger. So the maximum amount of energy that you put into a system is all the energy that's there. Without any external forces or things, that is all you're going to have. So if I take this pendulum and I raise it up, what kind of energy have I given it? Potential. And I release it, what kind of energy does it get? Kinetic. And then it comes back up, what does it have? Potential. Somewhere in between, what does it have? Both. Right? That's really important. We get in the habit with the law of conservation of energy of thinking we can only have one type at a time. But there's lots of different kinds of energy happening all the time. So what if I brought this up to my face? <coughs> right? Right? What would happen? Right? Am I going to hit myself in the face? Yes. Am I, what if I do that? Yeah. That would have 
would have totally hit me in the face, right? So let's have Pete do this instead, because... Yeah, I don't want to be dangerous. <laughs> Is Pete in danger? What's going to happen to him? He put a mask on. He seems smarter than me. He is smart. Do I need to be scared? Yes. yes. That was totally going to hit me in the face. Do I need to be scared? Yes. Why was Pete safe? What was the difference between the way Pete launched it and the way I launched it? I added energy to it. I gave it a push, right? So the maximum energy in the system was actually more than just the potential energy. The maximum energy that Pete put into the system was all potential to start. So when it came back to his face, that was what he had. And so the maximum energy you put into a system is the maximum energy that's there. So we just talked about energy bouncing back and forth between one form and another in one object. But we can also talk about energy bouncing back and forth between objects. There we go. Oh, I forgot about that. So, got preoccupied with my necklace. here we have a mass on a spring on a bendy piece of metal. And on the other end of that bendy piece of metal is another spring and another mass. So I am going to take one of these and get them going. So we now have one object moving. It has kinetic energy that is becoming potential energy. That potential energy is going into the spring and gravity. But that the energy is also starting to slosh from one to the other. And we see that the first one is slowing down and the second one is getting faster and faster. And at some point here, the first one will completely stop. And all of the energy is in the second one. And then the second one starts to slow down and the first one starts speeding up again. And all of that energy starts sloshing back into the first ball. And there will be some point in this cycle where the second ball comes to a complete stop. And then the cycle continues. So we have this energy bouncing back and forth between these. This is known as a coupled oscillator. This is working well because the masses are nearly identical. The springs are nearly identical. Now, we can also notice the whole thing is still slowing down a bit, all right? As this goes, we are losing energy. Are we losing energy? No. no. We have energy that is going into places that we can't see it. Some of the energy is becoming heat. Some of the energy is becoming sound. Some of the energy is rearranging some of the crystalline structure of the metal, right? There are all these things where the energy is going, but it's leaving the system. Now we want to talk about energy going into a system. Now we could do it with something like this, but you came all the way here. So we're going to do something a little bit more interesting. This is the spring from a garage door. If you have never seen someone working on a garage door, it's kind of amazing because Almost always there will be an experienced person and a rookie. An experienced person will walk 30 feet away and yell instructions to the rookie because garage door springs are low-key terrifying. <laughs> because they can have enough potential energy that they can lift a garage door. Now, we're not going to do anything nearly as extreme as lifting a garage door. We're just going to have Mary sit on it. Mm -hmm. 
Now, by now in the show, you have seen that I'm not exactly weak. Uh, but I think we can all agree that I am not strong enough that with one hand I could lift Mary five feet in the air. That is going to be beyond me. So deeply personal. Yeah. So Mary's going to sit down here. Hi, Dad! <laughs> so, My dad's scared of heights, by the way. So I'm not strong enough that I could lift Mary with one hand. So I'm not going to lift Mary with one hand. I'm going to lift Mary with two fingers. And it's going to go like this. and the bounce gets that much bigger. Now for many of you, this should seem familiar because this is exactly how playground swings work when you're pushing your friend. You are not strong enough to lift your friend eight feet in the air, but you can get them swinging dangerously high on a swing if your timing is right, right? But if your timing is wrong, right? If your timing is wrong, it doesn't work, right? If you're pushing someone on the swing and you wait until they're right at the bottom and you give them a shove, that ride is over, right? <laughs> like that's not gonna work anymore. So the reason this is working is because we've timed these little bits of force, this little bit of energy, to be in the right rhythm for Mary up on this spring. Yeah. Got it. Nice to shirt. Okay. Good. I lost the shirt yesterday. So, <laughs> well, this a phenomenon, little piece of it, not the whole shirt. <laughs> so this oh, phenomenon is called <laughs> this phenomenon is called resonance. The other place you have probably heard about resonance is in music. So Bill is now going to talk to you a little bit about musical resonance. So. We're going to replace Mary with a smaller verse. And this has everything that you just saw here. There's a spring. It's a U-shaped piece of steel. And there's a mass. There's a piece of steel. And so it turns out that the time it takes to bounce back and forth is related to A, how strong is the spring, and B, how much inertia, how much resistance to change there is. So tuning forks are expensive, not because they're complicated, but because they have to be accurately tuned. And so, if I hit this, it bounces back and forth very reliably at 320 vibrations every second. If I added mass to it, what would that do? What would it do to the number of times it bounced? Increase, added mass. Decrease. Added mass would make it harder to change its direction. It would be slower in doing that, right? So this is E of the first octave. Now I can take a smaller tuning fork. And what do you think it's going to do? Okay, it's got less inertia. So it's a higher pitch if you're a musician. It's a higher frequency if you're a physicist. This is 440 vibrations a second. Now, we have seen things work on a big enough scale that it was easy to see. It was big and slow. Our eyes reported well. Peter was this tuning fork. Mary was this tuning fork. So if we push on this at just the right time, it should start moving. 
it didn't. Because we didn't do it at just the right time. This tuning fork is pushing 440 times a second. This one wants to move at 320. They don't work. But look at this. We've got another 440. If I put this guy in here, But that, that's no longer magic, right? That would have been magic if we did this first. But you watched Peter push at just the right time. How is that possible? How do I get a little bit of air to move that? I didn't just get a little bit of air. Every second I hit that thing 440 times. So in a couple of seconds, that's been hit a lot. Okay? So this is acoustic resonance. We can't see it because our eyes don't report well on anything that happens more than 30 times a second. But our ears give us a great report. So there are many things that vibrate. Some of them vibrate in a way that we want them to, musical instruments. Some vibrate in a way we don't, loose panels in our car as we're driving. <coughs> If an object has got a certain amount of stiffness and a certain amount of inertia, right, see, you too can be annoying at a restaurant, okay? <laughs> Is that magic? Yes. I'm a Jedi Knight. <laughs> no. This glass has a natural frequency. Now, it is a multi-dimensional tuning fork. It doesn't just move that way. It's round. So the mouth of the glass bounces back and forth from round to horizontal oval and vertical oval. My finger is squeaky clean, so as it moves along, it sticks and slips and sticks and slips and kind of plucks the glass and makes it ring. So you heard that sound, but you don't know what that frequency is. Okay, or, unless a musician might, but we Philistines don't know. So we're gonna use all sorts of fancy stuff here. We have a signal generator and an amplifier. And that's a thousand cycles a second that you're hearing. And what's going on? is we are, whoa, come back. To convince this donut. Okay. Yay. So the center of this operation is this lump here, which is a mid-range horn driver from a rock band's speaker rack. It's capable of producing about 200 watts of sound coming through that little two-inch opening you see with the white piece of pipe there. We have a glass sitting here, and if we can match the resonance of that glass, the glass will ring. This is so loud, we're not going to be able to tell. So what we're going to do is put a ping pong ball in there so that if the glass is vibrating, we can't see it move, but we can see it move the ping pong ball. This is going to get a little bit loud. We will let you know when it gets worse. <laughs> no, it won't. <laughs> no, it won't. Okay, so at 1,000 cycles a second, nothing's happened. We're going to lower the pitch with this signal generator. Now notice, there was a point where it moved. It didn't, it's, it's not any quieter now. It's just not moving. Let's go back. And once again, it stops. So let's get back to that point. Okay, so that's 
looking pretty convincing. That's the resonant frequency of this glass, and it is 941 vibrations a second. The ping pong ball showed it to us. Unlike a tuning fork, glass is not terribly flexible. Okay? It also fatigues a lot faster than steel. If I can bend it back and forth, through a big enough movement enough times, the glass is going to fit fatigue and fail. So this is why Peter was warning you. We're going to try turning this up and see if we can break this glass. <coughs> now, we got a couple of things going on here. That all happens so at, at a high rate of speed, you, you only see it when the glass breaks. We would like to do better than that. There's a reason for coming to Penn. So we're going to reward you. We're going to use a strobe light. If you are strobe sensitive, you may want to step out of the room because we're going to turn the strobe on. Why are we going to use a strobe light? This thing's moving 940 times every second. A strobe light blinks on and we see it for an instant. If we turn it off for a 940th of a second, it's going to go through its whole wiggle. It'll be back where the light was on the last time, and our eye is going to get the same image it had a moment ago. We're actually going to see it sitting still, and we can freeze fan blades and do things like that. That's not very interesting. If we slow the strobe light down a little bit, now this thing, we get to see it. The light turns off, it moves, it comes back, the strobe light doesn't come on when it's back to where it was. The strobe light's a little late, and the glass goes a little further in its motion. Then the light comes on. It goes off, the, light, the, the glass moves, it comes back to where we last saw it, and the light is late. It goes a little further. So we get a slow motion view of the whole movement of the glass. And so we're going to be able to watch this glass behave. So I would like to turn this on and I want it a little bit slower than 940. So, we'll get a little slower. Okay, are we ready to go? Duh. Are you paying attention? Talk to me about that ping pong ball. What will that ping pong ball do? Physics words, come on, come on, make a mistake. Be brave enough to make a mistake. If somebody tell me what that ping pong ball does, the ping pong ball takes energy, right? If the ping pong ball gets energy, what doesn't get energy? The glass. So we've got to get the ping pong ball out of there. Aha! Now we're ready. That's glass. It's really moving that much. more exposure. And we hope that by 
letting you see all of this, it will sink in a little bit, and the next time you try to do some physics, you will have a bit more intuition about it. So thank you very much for coming down today. It is really <laughs> awesome.